Yeah, it's like Palm Sunday today. <laughs> Hosanna.
praise you, Lord. Amen. We praise you.
Aren't you glad we have a God who doesn't give up on us? Because he, he would have given up on me a long time ago.
seated in the Lord's presence today. So glad to have you with us. Even when we try to get away from you, 
you know, relent because you love us so much. And we ask today at Sunday School, why is it that you want us so much? It's because we were made in your image and you want us to be a reflection of who you are. So God, I just pray that we, not one person, will leave this place not feeling your love and your presence and just knowing how much you truly care and that with you all things are possible. Keeping that atmosphere, Lord, I just ask right now that as we give, let it come from, again, grateful hearts, but more important, hearts that are in awe of you, souls that are well because of you. And I pray right now, Lord God, that you will just multiply this offering for your kingdom and for the furtherance of it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, isn't it great that we could go to the Most High God and pray to Him? Not just to any God, but to Most High God. Amen. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you that, that all the needs that are represented here, our Father, needs that you want to take care of. And I'm asking that, Father, as we pray for that person, whatever you put upon their heart to do, that we would do it. So that, Lord, I thank you, Father. Lord, maybe they're just waiting for us to do something. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, all the needs that are need to be healing, Father, I ask that there would be abundant healing because you have come to give us abundant life and destroy the works of the enemy. So that we destroy the works of sickness and disease the enemy has tried to prosper among us. So I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And before anybody calls the office and let Debbie know she made a mistake in the baptism class up there, she already knows. <laughs> she, she said she puts the mistakes in the bulletin just to see if people are paying attention. <laughs> Today is Amy Goss's birthday. <laughs> Amy and Carolyn faithfully are here week after week and put us on Facebook for all those who live out of the area and can't make it. So Amy... Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Would you turn into your Bibles to Ezekiel 34? Uh, while you're turning there, does anybody know who was the most upset when the prodigal son came home? The brother. The brother. No, the fatted calf. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he never knew what hit him. <laughs> will squeal on you. <laughs> Ezekiel 34, keep your Bibles right open. And before we get into this book, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus sends out seven letters to seven churches. And each letter is addressed to the pastor of the church concerning the church. And they, they all start out similar to the angel or to the pastor of the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Smyrna Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And they were all letters, in the letters were, were words of commendation, conviction, and caution. Today, I start my 23rd year as pastor of this church. And I am far from an angel. But we started the church on September 3rd in the year 2000. And some of you have been here from day one. And some of you came shortly after and others filtered in after that. But that's 22 Thanksgiving services. 22 Christmas Eve services. You try to come up with something we hear after you hear. 22 East, 21 Easter, because I missed the last one. 22 Pentecost services and 1,196 Sundays. Wow. Wow. And I'll tell you, it's been the passion of my life. It's not just a job, it's a calling. Yes. And I love yes. my calling. It's also my wife's calling. Yes. She has been beside me all the way. 
pastoring. She's a better pastor than I am. Pastoring <laughs> and teaching two and sometimes three times a week. Yes. Staying up like last night till one thirty in the morning just to prepare. Well, I was 46 years old then, and I had a lot more energy than I do now. <laughs> I had a lot of hair back then and a little belly, and now I have... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I preach Saturday evenings. Yep, I remember. And two on Sunday. Yep. And one in the jails once a month, along with devotion on Wednesday prayer meeting. Wow. We did outdoor services. Yeah. We did door-to-door -door ministry. Yeah. We did drama presentations. Yeah. We did angel food ministry. Yeah. And a whole host of other things. It was an exciting time in a new church. And I've done some things well, and other things not so well. I made mistakes along the way, I made friends along the way, and I made a lot of people upset along the way. <laughs> and I am sure that the Lord has written a letter to me, for us. Because in 22 years, I'm sure there are some words of commendation, some words of conviction, and some words of caution. So it would probably read something like this. To the pastor of the Crossroads of Life Church, as you begin your 23rd year, this is my assessment of you in the church. You do some things well. You've done this well. You've done that well. You were okay in this area, not too bad in that area, but this I have against you. You were lacking in such and such, and such and such. So today I want to look at those areas that the Lord would speak to me about and to us. Because really this is more to me and to deacons, by the way. Because you know deacons, you are pastors of a smaller flock. Yes. So how well do you pastor your flock? Uh-oh. My title today is, This is Us. And maybe God is showing us, us today. Samuel told King David, thou art the man. Or this is you, David. And maybe he's telling us, this is us. So the title has a question mark after it. Meaning this is us? Or is this us? Ezekiel 34, 1 through 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, here it comes. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel or the leaders of the church. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with, you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the disease you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, and the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. Father, I'm praying for your help today. Lord, sometimes it's good to have a self-evaluation. Just don't be too hard. <laughs> Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a scathing rebuke that is. Amen? Amen. It is a rebuke for pastors and churches that have not done all those things. But it's also a reminder of the things that we should be doing or the things that we could be doing better. I had these verses from Ezekiel 34. I had them printed and framed, and they hung in my office for a long time, and I really don't know what happened to them. But I lost it somewhere, maybe during the flood, I'm not sure. But they were there to serve as a reminder to me of what not to do as a pastor. So I think I need another reminder after 22 years. Verse 1 is all about taking care of the flock or, the, or the, taking care of the church. A pastor's main job is to find lost sheep 
and to feed the sheep and help the sheep to grow and take care of the sheep and protect the sheep and to love the sheep. And I've tried over these 22 years to bring timely, spirit-filled messages. I hope messages of conviction at times. I hope message of commendation at times. I hope message of caution. I hope messages of hope. And I hope messages of encouragement. But this was a report card. <coughs> feeding the sheep. Maybe I would get C plus or B maybe. <laughs> After Peter's denial, Jesus reinstates him and says, Simon or, or Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, take care of my sheep. A third time he says, do you love me, Peter? He says, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. A good shepherd must love sheep. A good pastor must love people. Jesus said in John 10, 11, that a good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. And a hired shepherd, or on, for that person, him or who, it's just a job, they'll not lay down their life. But they'll put all their interests first. And then you would have to grade me on discipling or teaching the sheep. Or caring and protecting the sheep. Some of you would give me a grade of A, I know. And others would give me a failing grade. But one thing you can't dispute on loving the sheep, I would get an A+. Plus. Because I love you all. Of course, the Bible says I'm supposed to love my enemies, too. Yeah. I have to mix this for a little bit. <laughs> Jesus always uses the metaphor of a shepherd and sheep to describe the relationship between him and the church and the relationship between the pastor and the congregation. But verse 4 is the one that I want to look at today mainly. And this is the measure that we will be held to as a pastor and as a church. Verse 4. <clears throat> Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the loss. This is us. Or is this us? Have we ministered to, number one, the disabled? Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. Those who are sick and those who are shut in, have we visited? A visit to us, by us to these people would encourage them and even help in their recovery. In Matthew's account of the sheep and the goats in chapter 25, he says to the sheep, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. Why? For I was sick and you visited me. And they said, When did we see you sick? When did we visit you? And he said, When you did it to one of my people, even the least ones, you did it unto me. Amen. And to the goats, he said, Depart from me, accursed ones. When I was sick, you did not visit me. When did we not visit you? And as much as you didn't visit my people who are sick, it's as if you didn't visit me. This one has pierced my heart like a sword. Because especially for the last two years, I'm terrible at this one. I get a failing grade on this one. Some pastors are very good at it. I'm not. Not because I don't want to. I always try to make a point to come to the hospital and pray with people before surgery. But COVID just threw that whole thing out the window. Yeah. I couldn't even get into the hospital for a while unless it was end of life. And even now it's a process to get in. And nursing homes require a COVID test. I just hate those things. 
But all that aside, I still struggle in that area. Jeffrey Bukowski, a few months ago, put a cutting thing about his church family on Facebook. Forgetting all about him. And it cut me to the core. And I called him up and I said, you're right, Jeff. I've let you down. The church has let you down. We dropped the ball on the disabled. We dropped the ball on the sick, those in nursing homes. I dropped the ball. And I told Jeff, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mary Miller. Louise Marsh. Judy Furman. Will and Marie Harrison. Kurt and Leslie Moore. Charles and Sharon Twilliger, all members of this church that are disabled, sick, or shut in. And I'm sorry, I failed you. I had tried to set up a deacon position for shut-in visitation, but so far I had find, found none. This is an important ministry for someone. But it's not just me, it's us. This is us. How many people have you called? How many people have you visited? And I thank God for those who visit some of these shut-ins and Bonnie Bidwell, Rick Loretta Nelson, and others of you. But it's all of our responsibility. And we've got to do better. Because let's be honest, this is us. This is us with a question mark. Have we ministered to the second one, the diseased? It says, the disease you have not healed. How can we heal somebody? We're mortal. And yet, God tells us, Jesus tells us to heal the sick. He said, in my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Yes. Well, Jesus said we can do it. We ought to start doing it. Yes. We ought to start declaring healing into people's lives. Amen? Amen. Yes. yes. Those who have serious health problems, what have we done to help? Let's start boldly declaring healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 And we can also promote healing by helping. Those who have serious illnesses, yes, we pray for them on a regular basis. But you know they struggle with things in their everyday life. We are the body of Christ. I think of Bart Casterlin over there. My brother in the Lord. We're going to see him heal. Yes. 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 And not only those who have serious illnesses, but, but their spouses as well. You know, it's hard on them. I think of Joanne Williams. She's home and takes care of her husband, mostly by herself. What can we do to help and how can we help? I don't know. Pray about it. Maybe one day a week, the Lord would have you sit with her husband so she can get out. This is how the body of Christ should operate. <clears throat> Maybe send in a meal, take a meal, anything to help in their daily struggle. We don't know what they face every day. We take it for granted when our health is good. Again, some of you are very good at this. But we've got to do better. Because for the most part, this is us. Yes. This is us with a question mark. Have we ministered to the third thing, the damaged? The broken you have not bound up. Have we ministered to those whose lives are broken? 
We sing and we sang about it today how Jesus mends broken lives. We believe that, but guess what? He mainly uses us to do it. We just sit back and say, Lord, you do it. He said, no, I want to do it to you. Broken and damaged people by situations in life. Maybe the death of a loved one. The breakup of a marriage. And some of these people are in the pits of depression and they just can't pick themselves up by their bootstraps and get over it. It takes time and it takes some compassion from us. We need to start reaching out to them instead of writing them off. Take them to lunch. Give them a call. The church is full of damaged people and it should be. Some are damaged from their past. Like Mephibosheth in the Old Testament, who at five years old, his nurse dropped him and he was crippled and both feet through no fault of his own. Thank God you didn't have the upbringing that some of these in this room had. The word for this church many years ago, if we would take care of the ones that no one wants, he would send us the ones everyone is after. Then you have people that have life-controlling addictions and they come to church and how do we treat them? They're looking for their broken lives to be mended. And I know sometimes we look at them and say, well, it's a self-inflicted wound. But Jesus Christ can still heal self-inflicted wounds. Yes. Amen. Let's not write them off. And again, many of you are very good at this. Showing people that have value even though they are damaged. My mom is one of them. But we can do better. This is us. This is us, question mark, have we ministered to the defectors? The scattered you have not brought back. And that says, do we reach out to those who have left for one reason or another? Do we reach out for those who have backslid? A defector is a person who has abandoned their country, or in this case, abandoned the church, and abandoned their cause, or in this case, abandoned their faith. The ones who have left, perhaps from offense or whatever, those who are backsliding, we can't give up on them. We would need the arena if we brought back all the backsliders and those, those who have left out of offense. Yes. If it's an offense, we need to make it right. I had to do that just a few days ago. And as humbling as it was, that's how a Christian should behave when he or she behaves in a manner that they shouldn't behave in. And I'm not saying that we need to be perfect or act like perfect Christians in every situation. I'm saying that we need to rectify it when we don't. <clears throat> I think I might have told you the story when I first got saved. My brother Randy's here. He was part of it. And I, I say this to no glory to myself, but I'm a brand new Christian. I was involved in Royal Rangers. And it was a Wednesday night, and I had my Royal Ranger uniform on. I'm ready to go minister to kids. And up the road comes my brother Randy, car, screaming, squealing wheels, gets out with a shotgun. I said, what's the problem? Some guy across the street that was visiting stole something off his property, and he was going to get it back. If you know Randy, that's his way of getting things back. That's Randy. Randy, settle down. I'm a Christian. Let me go ahead and this. So I go knock on the door. And he'll tell you, Royal Ranger uniform, smiling. The guy starts giving me some lip, and I deck him. <laughs> I couldn't sleep all night long. I was troubled. And the next day I went across the street and I asked the people who lived there, who was that guy? I need to go and make it right. 
She said, well, he'll be up here in a few minutes. So he comes up and automatically, it's like that. I went up to him, I said, sir, I'm a Christian and I didn't act like a Christian. Did you forgive me? Mm -hmm. We shook hands, he forgave me. I was a bus captain. On Saturdays, I would knock on doors to get kids to go on the bus, church bus. So I'm over on Mary Street, and this kid is there and with, with somebody who comes to church and says, would you like to come to church? He goes, yeah. I said, well, where do you live? I knock on the door. Guess who answers the door? <laughs> Can you imagine if I hadn't made that right? You know what he said to me? If you go to that church, my kids can go. Amen. Amen. Oh. Hallelujah. I'm sure there's times in your Christian life when you haven't acted like one. We're human. We make mistakes. There's some Bob and... and Membership class. Finally, membership Whoa. class for Bob. He's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I said I had a pastor tell me he says that we're stupid men. Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. We all make mistakes, but we need to make it right. Yeah. Amen. People who have left the church, we shouldn't treat them as traitors. We're the family of God. Amen. And when we see them, we, we, we need to speak kindly to them and about them. Pastor Sam, is he here? He's not here. He excels in this. Now, there are some who have been asked to leave the church because of the harm they do to the rest of the sheep. And that's biblical. It's few and far in between, but there have been times. Jesus separated the sheep and the goats, and he told the goats to depart. Paul talks about removing certain people who show certain uh, unrepentant behavior from the fellowship for the good of the fellowship. A pastor's job is to protect the sheep. And then there's the backsliders, the ones who have quit coming to church and now they're out in the world. We can still love them without condone, condoning what they're doing. The father of the prodigal son loved his son, but he never condoned what he was doing. He never joined him in the pig pen. There's a way to do that without being judgmental. We can show them the love of Christ without approving of their behavior. Colossians 4 says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders or defectors. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. We had somebody stop just this week and said they were out witnessing and they witnessed to a, a, uh, a Jewish lady. And we know this particular person and she said she was terribly offended. And then Debbie says to me afterwards, he says, well, you get offended when somebody offends you the way they do it. <laughs> and sometimes we witness the people or backsliders and we're offensive. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. This is us? Question mark. Yeah. Have we ministered to the fifth thing, the disconnected? Nor have you sought for the lost. Do we have a heart for the lost? Or have we lost the heart that we had for the lost? These are the ones who are disconnected from God, alienated from God, and they're all around us. They're in the schools that we go to. They're in the places where you work. They're in the places where we shop. And some of them look like functional, upstanding people of society, and some of them are as dysfunctional as can get. But they all have one thing in common. They're all lost. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know about His forgiveness. And they're going to hell. And the Bible tells us whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it continues by saying, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? 
And how will they believe on him who have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher or someone to tell them? How beautiful, the Bible says, are the feet of those who bring good news. Are your feet beautiful? As individuals? As a church, are our feet beautiful? Sharing Jesus, what he's done for us, lets them know what Jesus can do for them. You don't have to beat them over the head with a King James version of the Bible. You don't have to spew out condemning scriptures to them. Show them the love of Jesus. This is an area that I think we all need to improve in. A heart for the lost. We need to have a deeper heart for these people. Jesus told us to lift up our eyes. Lift up our eyes from what? Lift up the eyes from the things that we think are important. Yes. And start seeing the things that Jesus thinks are important. Hallelujah. And who does he think? What does he think is important? Not baseball games. Not soccer games. Not any of this stuff. What does he? He thinks people are important. Yes. yes. Woo. Some of us don't even like people. I, was, I joked around many times. I love pastoring if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! You know, I'm not supposed to have gray hair until I'm 80. <laughs> but some of us don't like people. And especially dysfunctional people. <laughs> Everybody has value to God. Amen. He wants us to begin to see people that matter to him. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. For they are white for harvest. This is us. Or church, is this us? Would you bow your heads just for a moment? I just want the Holy Spirit to speak on those things to us for a moment. But I wonder if there's anyone here today that you're lost. You don't know Jesus. You've never experienced the forgiveness of sins. He can do that for you today. It's not about how good you are. It's about how good he is. His mercy and his grace. So anyone here who says, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. If so, just come. And then when you, would you stand? I just want to pray over this congregation as we begin our 23rd year. Father, I thank you for all the mountaintop experiences that we've had in 22 years. Lord, I thank you that you've been with us through many of the valley time experiences we've had in those 23 years. I thank you for every person who's walked through these doors and the doors at 219 Oak Street. I thank you for every one of them, Lord, who have come to the altar and given their lives to you over the years. Lord, I even want to thank you for those who have left for one reason or another. Some off the ministry, others because of offense or some other thing. Moving, whatever it might be, we thank you for each and every one. And I want to pray a blessing, not over this congregation, but over the crossroads of life converse, uh, con congregation yes. over 22 years. Amen. Yes. Some of them are now in a backslidden state. Some of them are safely tucked away into another church and ministering there. And we give you thanks for that. Some of them have passed away. But Lord, I pray a blessing over each and every one of them. I thank you for your words of commendation today 
Thank you for your words of conviction. To the pastor of the church, Crossroads of Life, and to its congregation, you say this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God has to say. Guide us over the next 23 years, we pray. Lord, let this be a spirit-filled church where people get saved, healed, delivered, and reconciled. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Okay, Pat. How'd you like it? I like it.